Good evening, everyone. Um, are you able to hear me? I'm hoping. Thumbs up. Uh, coming across. I'm sorry there's not anything better to look at with me, but you got everybody else in there and you look like a beautiful symphony uh, coming and joining in. But uh, I'm Mark King. I'm your conference treasurer. And I'm joined with my uh, good buddy and colleague, David Snipes, who's president and CEO of the United Methodist Foundation of Western North Carolina. And we're delighted uh, to be a part of uh, Congregational Finance 101. Uh, you're going to see in the chat box, and we invite your questions as you put there. We do want to ask everybody first to mute. Uh, themselves so that uh, we can control our sound. I think we're trying to do that on our own as well. But uh, put your questions and whatnot in the chat box, and uh, we will try to address them as we can. We want this to be conversational. Uh, we do have um, a lot of information to share. If you all have uh, joined us from previous times, some of it may be repeated from what we have shared before, but it's critical data, critical information for you to um, uh, know about the work that you do in your, your churches related to finance. I'm delighted to have you here. I'm delighted to welcome you. Um, as of a while ago, we have about 80 some people registered for this workshop. So uh, lots of folks are interested in the financial workings of their church and, and we hope this will be helpful. David and I will certainly be available offline. We'll put our email and contact info in the chat before we leave tonight. Uh, so if there's particular questions unique to your situation, uh, reach out to us perhaps better than taking our, uh, our evening this, the, the new just unique questions. But if you have questions or comments that you think the whole group would benefit, then by all means, please put those in. We, we welcome those. So I'm going to start tonight, and I'm going to, to be more on the side of uh, church accounting, um, uh, segregation of duties, the work of the finance committee, financial management in your church per se. David is going to deal more on the elements of stewardship in your church. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and get my PowerPoint going. Uh, you uh, got uh, this, some of you got, I hope all, I don't know about all of you, but some of you got this that was sent out earlier. What's in the chat box, the, the link to this is a much larger presentation than what I'm going to do tonight. There's no way I can cover everything in there, but I felt like each of those points were important for you to have in your work in the uh, financial management of the church. So it's yours to have, uh, but just know tonight what I'm going through is, is, is just kind of cutting to the chase of some things. So anyway, with that, let's get going. Everybody see this now, right? Okay. So here are the topics. Here are the topics that I personally feel like, uh, and I have been in several of your roles in the local church. I have served uh, rural churches. I have served uh, small town churches. I have served uh, small city churches, and I even had the privilege of serving a church in Manhattan. So I've seen the whole gamut of financial work in our local churches. And these are the things I think are important. Some of these are disciplinary, some of these are illegal, and then some of these are just very United Methodist. The main one that I really want to touch on, first of all, is what do you bring to our time? What is something that, um, that you're, you're particularly wanting to need? I would love to see that put in the chat box. Um, so that we can focus on some areas in these topics that uh, I'm looking at. And maybe what you're looking for tonight is not in these topics. And I would be glad to entertain what that might be and <clears throat> help you a little bit on those. But anyway, what this, this is your time. And so I don't want to go off in areas where it's not important to you. Uh, that's why I just want to briefly touch on each of these topics tonight um, and and maybe uh, will help uh, spawn some thoughts that you might like to have. But anyway, let's talk. This is important. And I get a lot of questions from churches over segregation of duties. What does the treasurer do? What does the finance committee do? What does the financial secretary do? I'm sure that is probably a role that you all, all every one of you have tonight in some capacity or another. This represents the financial management of your church. 
Now, if I've got any reverends on this tonight who's interested in this, God bless you. Usually I don't get reverends coming to this workshop, <laughs> but if you're a reverend or church staff member in this area, uh, that's wonderful. I'm glad you're here. What does the treasurer do? Uh, common answers include handle the church bank account, pay the bills, help collect, count the offering, deposit funds, do the reports, send out uh, financial donations. Sometimes you're responsible if you're not actually doing payroll, but you handle payroll. So uh, what, what a treasurer does and then the delegation of some of those duties is really up to each local church. But there are some required segregations. Uh, and the reason we do this is not because we don't trust people, um, but we want to protect them. So that's why when you have the treasurer responsibility and you may have a financial secretary or some other capacity person, those two roles should be very different, not served by the same person. Uh, it's protecting them. You don't want the same, the, the same person writing the checks, signing the checks, and also collecting and, and counting the money and being left alone to do all of that. That's, that's the one thing, I, if I can say tonight, please hear me to say very loudly, you wanna protect people because mistakes happen. It may not be intentional, mistakes happen. And you wanna help people make sure those are caught. And by having segregation of duties really does help. It protects church funds. It protects the treasurer and the financial sector and the committee. Um, and in most enterprises, you don't have the same person doing it all. You have a system of checks and balances, and it provides backup as well in case of illness, death, or disability. Every year, I hear from our churches about instances of fund embezzlement, uh, theft, um, malfeasance, uh, and these funds are not taken by some uh, Johnny or Jane come lately. Uh, they are taken by trusted treasurers or financial secretaries. Everybody knew. They are our small town neighbors for the most part. Uh, you would be surprised at how long some of these uh, violations go in some of our churches for years without being caught. And then it gets to be too late. Um, it usually starts very small, very small, borrowing funds just to, to get through a tight spot. Um, and then it grows and grows because they're not caught until it's too late. And um, if you have controls in place, it makes that kind of barring, those kinds of first little steps, very difficult to keep people away from disaster. I wanna talk about this broad triangle. And, and this is to help you understand what does it take for embezzlement to surface in your church. And typically when all three of these are ripe, uh, you, you're just inviting trouble. Um, the first one is pressure. And this is on the individual. This is their motivation. This is why they even think about dipping into the pot, so to speak. They themselves are under pressure in their life. They have a lot of things going on, addiction, debt, gambling habits, whatever. And so uh, already they're being pushed. Honestly, you can't do anything about that. That is their issue. They are self-made issue on, on the pressure. There's just nothing you can do about their life circumstance. The other uh, part of the triangle, the red, is rationalization. Uh, they begin to justify how they might dip into the pot. Well, I'm only borrowing the money. I'll pay it back. This is just to get me through. Well, the preacher, he's not this. Well, the finance chair, he, everybody has his bad reputation, her bad reputation. You know, they start rationalizing on and on. Fortunately, again, this is nothing you can handle. You can't really control this. This is on them. They, they're the ones that start putting this together. And then the third one is opportunity. Opportunity. This is where controls and the church allows something to happen. This is the one you as financial leaders do have control over. Um, and that's why the segregation of duties is so important, is to prevent opportunity. Uh, no one, uh, I put up these statements in blue, no one checks the bank statements to verify the bank balances. No one ever verifies reserve funds are there. 
See, that's creating an opportunity. Uh, no one checks that the mailed offerings are verified and sent. So there's an opportunity. No one reviews cancel checks. Uh, the same persons uh, or related persons. You have um, <clears throat> Jane and her husband always counting the offering every week. The same. Then yeah, you got two people, but they're related. And the discipline is very specific that the counting, the offering counters cannot be members of the same immediate family. I know in some of our smaller membership churches, that's a challenge, but I would rather work toward preventing that opportunity and honoring that, that, that requirement than, um, than being caught later. So anyway, that's the fraud triangle, and that's, that's, that's where um, segregation of duties really does, does help you. Um, when you remove opportunity, you drastically decrease the chance for fraud. And I want to remember, I just I have to lift this up and just say, Jesus was tempted. Our Lord and Savior was tempted. Uh, he overcame it. But everybody at some point or another could be fought to, to could be uh, tempted and whatnot. So the question is, do we have to segregate duties? And you expect to hear some, particularly in, in, in well, we're just a small church. We don't need to do this. We trust everybody. It's too much work. And you may hear this from your very treasurer or your financial secretary who doesn't want to give up what they enjoy doing because they're doing it all together. Um, these are not valid reasons, folks. Uh, you need to have controls in place so that your church is protected, your people are protected, and your witness, your ministry is protected. So think about this for just a moment. What is the biggest challenge in your church situation to segregating duties? Um, anybody want to uh, put into the chat what is a challenge your church might have in segregating the duties? I see a lot of things coming up in chat for questions that we'll look at in just a minute. We don't have enough people. Yeah, that, that's, I think, the biggest one, particularly on the offering county. Uh, uh, and I wish I had a, a cut right answer for you. So here's what you do. Um, but it's, it's, it's still important to try to work toward that. It's still important to work toward that. Uh, at least... If, 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 if you can't have the, the number one segregated duty should be between the person who's counting the offering or recording the offering, recording the contribution, and the person who's able to authorize expenses and checks. Those are, if nothing else, two duties that should done, be done by two separate people and not in the same family. Okay, I want to go back up here in just a minute and look at some of these uh, questions that come up so I can be sure that we uh, we tackle them. Uh, source of funding grants opportunity. David's going to probably cover that one a little bit, Philip. Good question. Uh, software, uh, using ACS. Is anyone else outsourcing to a bookkeeper or CPA? You know, I'm getting that question a lot. Churches are calling me asking for references uh, because with the complexity of the laws and complexity of accounting nowadays, uh, it's a lot to ask a volunteer to take on a lot of this. I get that. Um, and we at the conference are exploring some uh, uh, opportunities to help with that as well. So uh, be looking for something about that to come out in the future. But yeah, anybody put in the chat that if you're outsourcing, um, just let, let put in your contact info and let's let's share that. Uh, stewardship, I'm gonna let David uh, tackle that one. Okay, what software everybody put in there, what software they're using. I think we're caught up on the question. Yeah, 
Yeah, you would think, but then I'd have to turn around and charge you. <laughs> Connie, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. We are exploring some possibilities, but we got to get through this disaffiliation season. And, and I honestly believe 2024 is a, a brand new day that we are going to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we would uh, need to um, recoup the cost if we did that, but we're exploring some opportunities for you. Okay, all right. Let's talk about uh, a little bit on this, uh, just so that you are informed and aware, please, on pensions and health benefits, apportionment, taxes, and audits. Oh my, if I can get through uh, all of these in my lot of time. And basically, I want to just educate you on terms and processes so you understand coming from this. Um, let's talk about pension and health benefits first. Um, there are several categories related to the pension program. Let's we'll do pension first. Uh, you'll see these words pop up and you probably wonder what in the world do they mean? And there, there is a definition to them. Uh, CRISP, C-R-S-P, stands for the Clergy Retirement Security Program. Um, this is the program that comes out of West Path, formerly known as the, um, the General Board of Pensions and Health Benefits for the United Methodist Church. Um, this is the program that the General Conference approves and puts into place and is our national pension program. And it's, 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 a, it's a hybrid. It contains two parts. One is the DB, which is defined benefit. Defined benefit is the old timey pension part. You work for a company for so many years, then when you retire, they're going to pay you out of pension. You didn't have to put anything into it. You just had to have time allotted and credited service. Well, United Methodist Church still has a component of that. Now, this year at General Conference, West Pass is going to be bringing some legislation to change all of that. And to go forward, we will probably, if it's passed, if approved, we will not have this component anymore. It will all be based on uh, the defined contribution, which is the DC, which is what most people have nowadays, a 401k or in the nonprofit world, a 403B, or a simple IRA, or a step IRA. These are where if the employee will put money in, the employer will match it up to a certain point. That's why it's called defined contribution. And it basically requires a partnership between employer and employee. Now, we have that in our program already. It's, it's, it's Like I said, it's between the two. And the churches are billed uh, from us as we are billed by West Path to cover clergy who are either half time, three quarter time, or full time. Now, I will tell you the defined benefit you're not paying as a church what West Path bills the conference. The conference uses this investments to offset that almost up to 40%. But you're really only paying about 60% of what West Path bills us for. So please keep that in mind as a value that you do get from the annual conference. With the defined contribution, uh, each clergy automatically gets 2% of their salary and housing. If they will put in another 1%, then the conference puts in additional 1%, and we build the churches for that. So churches either build 2% or 3% based on what their pastor is doing or the appointed clergy is doing. CPP stands for the Clergy Protection Plan. This is the death and disability component. Uh, where clergy who are disabled or if they die, their spouse dies, they have children at home die, there's a death benefit payment, there's disability built into that as well. <clears throat> You're only paying, again, a prorated section of that. Uh, the conference has billed 3% of every clergy salary and housing. We only bill 2.5% to the churches. We pick up the other half percent from our own investment. Then we also have an active health plan insurance. We are self-funded right now. I'm, we're all looking at wondering how long that's gonna continue. Uh, when you have uh, you know, a, the large number of clergy that we used to have, self-funded makes sense. But as our clergy pool is now dwindling, um, it's, it's becoming quite costly. And so we are exploring that. But uh, the church pays the minister's premium the pastor or appointed clergy in the program does pay a portion based on their salary, a percentage based on their salary. And then if they want to add dependent coverage, spouse, children, or family, 
That's 100% on the clergy. And so for the pastor contribution and the dependent coverage, our recommendation is you withhold it from their salary. Uh, you can get that from their clergy compensation form. You withhold that from their salary. We bill them, they bring the bill to you, and you pay it. Now, I don't know about every church doing that, but that's our recommendation. We do offer supplemental insurance through Colonial Life, kind of like the athletic products of uh, uh, life insurance in addition to what we offer automatically, uh, severe illness, uh, accident. And again, these are at the cost of the pastor, not the church. And a lot of our pastors just get this anyway, and they don't, they don't do any withheld, but they can do that if, if the church is agreeable. Then we also have a flex account. We have medical independent care. So then if they want to put some money of their salary aside to cover the deductibles, co-insurance, child care, uh, we, we can set this up as well. And uh, we bill them and they turn that in and, and have you pay it or we add it to your bill and you pay it as depending on what the pastor um, requests. Then the one thing that, that you get straight from West Pass is the minister's contribution to their pension plan. This is called the United Methodist Personal Investment Plan, UMPIP, is 403B, and it's where the part that they withhold from salary, West Path is going to build a church for that. Now, that means West Path has to be notified of how much to build. And some of our churches aren't aware that they should do that or forget how to do that. If you're not as up to date on that, reach out to me, reach out to Dale Bryant in my office and treasure services. And we'll be glad to, uh, to help you get set up on that. There's a form, the form you fill out, you put the pastor's salary on there, how much they want withheld, send it to West Pass, and they'll bill you. I will tell you that if this new plan that West Pass is bringing to the general conference in, in April and May, when they meet in Charlotte, uh, is passed, that's going to all change. Uh, it's all going to be from the conference billing you. There's going to be no more separation between West Path billing you and we billing you and all that confusion. We're going to try to get that all taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> as I've already said, uh, define what Chris does to define benefit, define contribution. Um, contributions to the UMPIP could be before tax, which is what I recommend it, it gives you. But some of our clergy, for whatever reason, think they're in a lower tax bracket now than they may be when they retire. Uh, so they want it after tax. That's totally up to them. Um, they don't, but it's on them to let you know which they want to go, how they want to prefer for that. Um, and like I said, West Path will, will be done for this. I will tell you and I'm really say that uh, if you do withhold anything from the pastor's pay, uh, their pension contribution, their FSA or dependent care, medical, dependent, any of those, if you you need to pay those within within 30 days. That's the law. Uh, if you wait and hold on to it longer than 30 days, you're, you're actually in violation and uh, uh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Health benefits, uh, we bill you for that. And our health plan is for full-time and three-quarter time pastors. Now I said at half time, we cover pension but we don't do health benefits at half time. And then anything under half time, quarter time or whatever, there are no benefits. So half time is pension, three quarter time and full time is health and pension. Um, some of our clergy do not want to be on our health plan. Uh, they have that option to opt out. They got to fill out a form and attest to it. Unfortunately, and this is not my rule, this is not Treasury Services rule, this is the annual conferences rule that's voted on by the delegates every June whenever we meet. Uh, if they opt out, the church does not get uh, a freebie on that. And that's because we build these, uh, the health plan by position, not by person. You know, some, some companies, some health plans have tiered rates so, you know, the, the, the healthier or the younger don't pay as much as older or not as healthy. We, got, we don't want to do that. We have one rate, and it's full, uh, basic, based on each full-time appointed clergy. So I do have to tell you that. If your clergy person opts out of the plan, the church will still be built. And here's part of the logic behind that. We move clergy around. 
They go from church to church. The health plan stays with them. You don't want to get a freebie for four years and then you get a new pastor and bam, you got to pay the health insurance all over again when you had you off of the four years. And that's cataclysmic to churches. So that's why we, we kind of keep it in there. We have three plans. We, uh, we call them the plan 6,000. That's probably what 80 to 85% of our clergy are on. Uh, it's, it's the basic plan. It's the highest, higher copay, the higher deductible, but it's a lower cost. There is a, the church pays the same cost regardless of the plan the clergy's on. So please keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> but some of our clergy are not as healthy as others, and they rather have lower copays, a lower deductible, and so we offer the plan 4000 They must pay the difference between this plan and the cost of the plan 6000 Like I said, all three of these plans are the same cost to the church. Uh, but they must pay the difference, and it's it, it's. Yeah, I won't go into it tonight, but I don't. I think it's not worth it. And then we do have a health savings account plan, which has a high deductible, but instead of funding like a flexible medical account where it's use it or lose it, the HSA stays with them year to year to year. They can put in if they're on this plan the conference, not the church. The conference puts in and they take it with them. But the deductible has to be met before we pay anything. And we're seeing this grow. We don't have as many people on it right now as I would like, but we are seeing it grow. And the church pays the, the same cost, um, again, regardless of all that. Let me stop now. Are there questions coming up in chat on any of these? Mark, I did put your research uh, resource page from the conference website in there for everyone because you have some really some of the forms that you're talking about, some of the information that you're talking about uh, can be found there and be really helpful. Thank you. I see about the pyramids. I'm I'm gonna let that one just stay in the chat. <laughs> I'm get in trouble if I deal with this. Okay, good. So no questions on benefits at this point. And again, if you have unique questions related to your uh, situation, uh, my email and everything is, is in the chat. Please call me or reach out to me. I'll be glad to help you with that. Uh, Dale Bryant in Treasure Services is, is, is uh, responsible. He's my key person on benefits and he would be available for you as well. All right, this is everybody's favorite topic, I know, but I just want to touch on it so that you are informed of where these come. Um, basic, first of all, and you're doing this right now, you're doing your year-end report. Um, this is where we pull the information for portions. We don't go into some back room and just hodgepodge up a conjured uh, incantation for what a church's apportionments will be. We base it on approved formulas by the conference when they meet in session, taken from information that you give us, uh, primarily in table two for apportionments in your year-end report. Please, please carefully do this because it impacts your apportionment so much. I've seen decimals or extra zeros get into those things and creates havoc uh, with apportionment. A church will write me and say, our apportionment's doubled. What happened? Well, we go back and we look at table two, and instead of paying their pastor uh, $50,000, they're paying them $500,000. And you know that's just going to mess up the whole thing. So please look at that. We try to catch these as much as possible, and we do. We do catch a, a lot of the mistakes before we submit. But it really helps us if you're able to do this. Discipline says that the minister is responsible for this information. But when it comes to table two and the money, it really helps to have the finance people working on this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's included and what's not included from table two in just a minute. But apportionments are simply the conference budget divided up, that's where that word comes from, among the churches of the annual conference. The idea is that every church pays a fair share in the conference budget. Large, bigger churches pay more than smaller churches. Wealthier churches pay more. Uh, but it's fair and it's based on when we look at the uh, certain expenses that you uh, 
you know, spend your money on uh, over a three year average. We don't just look at one year. We have to go back to three. It's allocated, uh, unfortunately, based on that information. And it, 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 apportionments are based on expenditures. We don't look at income. Income is in table three of your year end report. Expenditures is table two. That's what we look at. And let me dispel this notion right now because people still ask it. Apportionments have nothing to do with your membership. We don't base any apportionment calculation on how many members you have, your worship attendance, none of that. It's all in table two of expenses. So, for instance, um, and, and, and 2024 was a weird year. So bear with me. I'll get to it in a minute. But normally, normally, we will take the conference average net expenditures of the three most recent years of every church and come up with, uh, divide that by the annual conference budget and come up with a multiplier. Believe it or not, that multiplier is about 10 or 12 digits long to the right of the decimal. We do the multiplier all the way to where it stops at zero because we want to be absolutely fair to every church. Then that multiplier, once you get that, is applied against each local church's three-year average for the apportionment. That's how we come up with that for the general church and the conference. Now, the general church and the conference is a conference-wide budget. It covers all eight districts, all the churches. Uh, district apportionments are only done in the same way for the churches in a district. So that's why it's calculated a little bit different. In 2024, because of disaffiliation, and because so many of our, uh, our, our disaffiliating churches will require to pay toward the 2024, uh, based on 2023's apportionment, they had to give us an extra year of apportionment. We were able to take that money and set aside. And when we looked at the conference budget, and we looked at the remaining churches, those that did not leave, we were able to meet that conference budget with a 2% reduction for the remaining churches. And so 2024 is weird. Uh, your apportionments went down in 24 based on uh, compared to 23 because we had that, those extra funds. Uh, the district apportionments were frozen. The 2024 district apportionments are the same as the 2023. And when you put it all together, um, your conference and general church apportionments are about 8% of your local church's expenses. Now, this, this is an average, may be different depending on the local church. And if you put the district apportionment in, it adds about 1%. So we're not even collecting a tithe. We're at 9%. Uh, as long as I'm your treasurer, I am committed. And I can speak for the council on finance as well. We are striving to reduce the apportionment budget every single year. We rather you keep more of your money in your local church, in the local community, because you know how to spend it. We're working very hard. And because now our conference is, as you heard the bishop say a while ago, we are a third smaller. We cannot maintain the same conference budget, even at 2024 levels. It's just not going to be there. We're not going to go back and punish the remaining churches by increasing their apportionments to sustain what we currently have. So a lot of things are being looked at. Uh, a lot of things are on the table in discussion, but we are committed that the 2025 apportionments uh, will not be more than the 2024. So you heard me say it, and you can crucify me if it's violated against that. I will be, I'll take that punishment. What apportionment, what, what expenditures go into the apportionment calculation when we do actually do the calculation. Well, here are the five areas that we tackle. Appointed clergy benefits, appointed clergy compensation, salary and housing, staff compensation and benefits, your program expenses, and your operating expenses. So these five areas listed on the year-end report is what we take into the averaging. What's not included are these four. What you pay in apportionments. Now, that used to be included. It's not anymore. Anything you take in on special Sundays, um, uh, Uncore Sunday or Student Sunday or Native American Sunday, none of those are counted. Anything you pay toward missions, 
anything you pay toward the advances, none of those are counted. Uh, nothing you pay toward principal and interest on debt, that's not counted. And anything called capital improvements. Now here's one question I get a lot. I said earlier, operating expenses versus capital improvements. There's a difference. Think of it like this. You have an air conditioning system in your church. It needs Freon. It needs a repair, a fan belt breaks. That's an operating expense repair. But you buy a whole new heating and air conditioning system, that's a capital improvement. So when you're going through and allocating these expenses from your own your year report, make sure you differentiate between those kinds of things. Gas and oil in your church van, that's an operating expense. You gotta pay for those things to keep it going. You buy a new bus or a new van, that's a capital improvement. A roof repair to replace some shingles, that's an operating expense. A whole new roof, that's a capital improvement. So those kinds of things. If you ever have doubt, reach out to me and I'll be glad to, to mull through it with you a little bit. We'll see. Any questions on, uh, I'm flying through this too fast. I know folks, I'm sorry, but let me pause. Are there any questions about the apportionments or any comments related to that? Connie, I like what you said. We have a lot of expenses last year, but only one third of the members. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me talk just a minute about taxes. For the most part, the church doesn't have to pay a lot of tax. United Methodist Churches come under the UMC 501c3 classification as a tax-exempt entity. This means that you do not pay any income tax on your income. You're not like a, a corporation would or a for-profit business. Um, doesn't mean you're wholly tax exempt, but for the most part, you know, you're not paying, you do not pay income tax uh, on anything of your income. Now, there are certain taxes that you do pay. You do need to pay payroll taxes on your non-appointed or non-ordained staff. That's FICA, that's Social Security. Now you don't pay it on clergy. Please don't pay it on clergy. Do not withhold it from clergy. They are self-employed for Social Security. But you do pay FICA for your uh, non-clergy staff. Both your clergy and well as your non-clergy uh, staff may wanna have income tax withheld. Uh, if they elect that or you agree to it for the clergy, you don't have a choice on the non-clergy. You have to withhold it. Those are paid. Now, they're withheld. They come out of their, their salary. They come out of a separate bucket for the church, but they are meant to be sent in. If you have unrelated business income, and this is a deep topic that we don't have time to go into a whole lot tonight, but uh, you have income, for, for instance, let's say that you have a parking lot downtown and you are uh, charging uh, downtown people to, 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 to have the ability to park in your parking lot. That may be unrelated business income. There could be some tax related to that. If you sell things like a bookstore or jewelry or anything on a sign like that, uh, you may have to pay sales tax. Uh, and you certainly pay sales tax on things that you uh, you purchase. But if you sell them, you may have to recoup. You may have to take in sales tax. But you definitely have to pay sales tax uh, on things that you purchase. And North Carolina, the <clears throat> North Carolina allows for churches and other nonprofits to get a refund of the sales tax they pay on the majority of items. Uh, items you cannot ask a refund for are like utilities, sales tax on utilities you're not able to do, on prepared foods. You know, you have Pizza Hut, Tater Mill, and they charge you sales tax. You can't get that back. I don't know why. I don't know why the legislator differentiated on these, but I just know it's the law. Uh, but anything you go and buy at Walmart, anything you go buy at Food Line, and, you know, these other places, Lowe's, Home Depot, you've got sales tax. Keep a record of it. And you can apply. There's a form you fill out. If you don't know what it is, reach out to me. I'll be glad to send it to you and walk through it with you. Uh, but you get your sales tax back. And it's usually done twice a year, January to June, 
in July to December. And you have up to three years to be able to go back and, and claim uh, sales tax from previous year. But you got to keep up with it. Because if you're ever audited by the North Carolina Department of Revenue, they're going to want to see where you got that number from. So there are receipts and things like that you keep. And then sometimes you have to pay property tax on property that's not considered used for exempt purposes. A uh, classic example of this is if you have a parsonage, your pastor doesn't live in the parsonage, uh, they have their own home, so you're dealing with that, but you rent the parsonage to a third party. Well, uh, you're making money off of that. And the, the county is probably going to look at that as you're not using that parsonage for exempt purposes. It's a money-making thing. You may have to pay property tax on that. It's important every year to, uh, to be sure and look at what your county's exemption policies are. Sometimes you have to apply for the exemption. It's not automatic. And some churches get caught. They get a tax bill in April, and they miss the deadline. So usually it's January, so you've got about another week. If you're not sure, find out from your county what their exemption practice and policy is. Churches uh, taxes you do not pay. You do not pay unemployment tax. And you can, you can opt into it, but I, I don't think many churches do. That's from both the federal and state. So if you got a payroll service, make sure they're not uh, they're not calculating unemployment tax because you're not supposed to pay that. As I mentioned, you don't have to pay income tax on your contributions and other related. You don't have to do social security on your clergy. Now, I will tell you that some clergy prefer the church to withhold money to send into the government. They're already doing it for other church staff. They may want to do that, but they have to give you that number. For clergy, I wouldn't mess with the table because the clergy, if they think all their withholding is based on those tables, they're going to have a horrible wake up with social security because clergy are self-employed for Social Security. That is the, uh, the law. It uh, goes way back to when Social Security was started under the New Deal. The only employee churches had back then were pastors, and so church and state came in. They had to keep separated. The clergy were exempted, or churches were exempted from being the employer for, for clergy and Social Security. Uh, clergy still have to pay into it, um, and therefore, uh, they need to give you the number that encompasses all of that. Again, that's on them. Uh, we try to train our clergy on understanding that, uh, but just be aware they may come to you with a large number for taxes. And what they're trying to do is both their federal withholding and what they have to pay on Social Security. What questions do we have about this? What amount do you consider minimum for cash? I don't know that there's a minimum. It's really what you spend. I mean, if you're buying capital, I, I think I know what you're saying. You know, is there, when does it trip over between operating and capital? I think it's really the, the, the purchase itself. Um, certain capital, like a, a new window for the basement of the church may not be that expensive, but that's a capital improvement. So there's not really a minimum. You'd have to determine what the, the per purchase was. And then everyone should, should be filling out that, yeah, absolutely. That's, thank you, Ken. That's important to do. And uh, there's the form. Uh, David put it in for you. It's, it's not the easiest form to fill out. Um, and, and there's a code in there that, that has to go to what we are. And if you've never done that form before, reach out to me and I'll help walk through it with you. With you. All right, a model we can use to compare repair versus replacement, where impact apportionments are considered over several years. Um, Wait, well, you're stumping me a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. Is there kind of some kind of matrix that we can offer you, like a spreadsheet? That I, I don't have that. I, I'm sorry, I really don't. Um, and and unfortunately. We can't go back to prior years anyway. It's only now you're reporting for 23 that we have an opportunity to, to manage, manage that. Good question, Becky. In box 14, remember box 14, the IRS simply puts on the form for the employer to use at their discretion. The IRS does not really read box 14. 
but it's good information to give to your employees for things that you do. I highly recommend Box 14 for your clergy to include all housing amounts, both the housing and Louisville Parsonage, as well as what they may do through salary reduction for housing, that you put both of those in Box 14. That's really the only other thing Box 14 is used for. Uh, you don't don't put the value of the parsonage. That's something they got to come up with. So I, I wouldn't get into that territory. But it's primarily housing. It's what would go in box fourteen. Okay. All right. One quick word on audits. This is a horrible word. Nobody likes the word audit. <laughs> uh, but we do require. Uh, the audit to be done by the Book of Discipline. That doesn't mean you got to hire a CPA to do it. Because we all look at that and say, oh my gosh, I can't afford a CPA to come in and do this every year. Uh, the key word is it is an independent examination by uh, <clears throat> unbiased persons that can be members of your church who uh, look at certain things uh, in your internal controls, look at certain financial pieces of information, and just make sure that things are balancing, things are in place for uh, uh, internal control. Um, it can't be by the person who's doing it. It needs to be an unrelated party in that reflection. Um, we do recommend an outside professional if your annual receipts are more than 300,000. Now again, doesn't have to be a CPA. There are a lot of accountants out there, bookkeeping firms, they're not CPAs, but they do this work. They understand it, and they're probably credible enough to help you with that. Certainly, now a CPA is going to do your the most in-depth um, work on an audit. That's what they're about. I mean, they're certified public accountants. That's where that comes from. They go in, they look at a, a, a entity's financial statements. They uh, compare how uh, they're, you know, done in the past. They look at internal controls. And, you know, um, if your expenses are $300,000 or more, maybe you do an audit or, or review. A review is a, a, a lesser uh, type of audit every three years. And uh, just to keep things kind of in a pattern like that. Uh, we do have information on our my website, an audit guideline that you can give to individuals in your church uh, who would be willing to serve on an audit committee, two people, three people, that's really all you need. And they just go through and they look at cancel checks, they look at bank statements, they look at W-2s, and they're just issuing a report that they feel like everything, uh, in their opinion, reflects the true financial condition of the church. All right, let's look at these and take a break. I'm afraid no one's going to find us. Don't worry, I give $100,000 a year. My pastor is on the search boat looking for me, I'm sure. Guy comes in, I need to talk to the top hog. Sir, we don't call the minister a top hog. I want to give the top hog a $10,000 offering. Well, I think I hear the little porker driving up to the church right now. And then finally, this one, how many of you feel this? We only give when we felt led, and the last time we felt led was 1979. We've got a few questions coming up. Uh, financial health checkout, that's a good idea. Yeah, and, uh, I think an audit can do some of that for you, but uh, we do have a financial checklist on my website that if you want to use, it can help you too. Is the church required to pay FICA? No, that's what I'm saying. You're, you're, you're actually prohibited from. Uh, ministers are self-employed for FICA, so don't withhold, don't match. Um, they're responsible for that. Actually, I need to amend a W-2 if I forgot. You don't have to amend it. No, again, it's at your discretion. You're not required to put the housing in box 14. Uh, it's just a courtesy. It's, it's at your discretion. Uh, I, I know one church asked the same thing, and, and it was too late. And I said, don't, don't correct the W-2 just for that. Just tell the minister what their housing was. You know, Put it in a memo or some other kind of document. Give it to them so that when they're taxed, prayer can, can work on it, they'll, they'll be fine on that. Folks, that's really what I wanted to cover tonight, just skimming over several of these important things. But I also am very concerned and very interested on what's going on in your congregation. Um, it's tough out there right now. We are in a de-churching environment. 
Uh, we can't take people going to church for granted anymore. The bishop talked about that, that if we're going to be viable and sustainable, we're going to have to work harder than we ever had before. The United States and North Carolina and all our various counties are mission fields. And so churches are struggling financially. I don't know of a single one that's got more money than it knows what to do with. Um, and so we're concerned about that. We, we want to, 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 to be a partner with you in that. And David's going to talk about some very important things. But I'd like to just take a few moments, if we could, about five minutes, and then I'll finish up. I'll wrap up. Five minutes. And I want you to get into clusters or groups and have a moment to share. And I, mainly, I'm wanting you to hear what others are also going through so that you don't feel alone, that you don't feel like, hey, is anybody else doing what we're having to do? So in our breakout groups, uh, here are the questions. What are one or two major traditions related to finances that has or is disappearing? What is a minor one that is going on that you may not miss and be good for it to go away? And what has become a new sacred tradition in your church related to finances? So we're going to put you in the groups of about four each, and let's take about five minutes to, to just talk among each other about what's unique in your situation, and then we'll come back and finish up this part. Okay, I think everybody's coming back in now. Um, I'm putting my contact info in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. That phone number is my direct number. You don't have to go through the switchboard. Uh, I get a lot of calls, so if it goes to voicemail, just rest assured, I'm going to try to get back to you within 24 hours. I saw in the chat while you were in break, Connie asked a question about um, outside groups coming in. Connie, I really think that if you're serving your community in that way, particularly community groups like HOA, the preschool, it um, reflects your ministry. Uh, I would not consider that unrelated business income. And certainly is not something that you need to worry about endangering your tax status. Uh, it's when you have Walmart come in and take over your whole building for weeks at a time that that starts to get a little, a little iffy. Um, and the basic rule of thumb is, is uh, for tax consideration is even unrelated business income should never be more than 20% of your total income. That includes contributions and designated gifts and, uh, and the whole gamut. So I think you're pretty good right there, in my opinion, in my thinking on that. Um, and then uh, uh, I saw Becky, Becky, reach out to me uh, individually. I might have some uh, help with you there. Um, it's tough right now in that world. It, it really is. There are companies out there willing to do it. I know that. It's, it's uh, just having them understand church stuff. Folks, I have gone over my lot of time. I, I appreciate and ask apologies for David, but I'm going to turn it over to him now, and uh, he will conclude the rest of our time tonight. Thank you all. Hey, everyone. I hope that you felt a little bit of a break in, in the process this evening when you went into the breakout room. Uh, for those of you that started at 6 o'clock with the bishop, I know this has been a long night. But uh, please know how much Mark and I and, and other leadership in the conference appreciate your commitment to your local church. Um, we, we are here to help you in whatever ways that we can. So I always jokingly say, and I said this to Mark before we started this evening, the information that he just shared with you is information that you need. It talked about taxes, it talked about payroll, it, he talked about apportionments, all of those things that will help you do your job and fulfill your role in your local church related, related to treasurer or a part of the finance committee. So that stuff you need. I jokingly say, now I'm going to share with you what we want you to include in that role. Uh, uh, serving as treasurer or as, on the finance team or the stewardship team, if that's something separate at your particular church. So we realize that people come to the topic of stewardship a little differently. Um, often we equate stewardship with an event, usually in October in the local church, where you talk about raising money. But the reality is the 
Stewardship, which we like to talk about it and refer to it within the United Methodist Foundation as being faith and money. It's about our faith journey, who we are as disciples, and therefore, when we take that into consideration, how we use the money that God has entrusted to us. So I'm going to put my PowerPoint. Hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, Mark, give me a thumbs up if you see my. Thank you. So one of the things that I would want you to do internally, we're, the, my part of the, of the presentation this evening is kind of broken down into at least two, if not three different areas. Number one, individually, how you view stewardship, and then corporately, how you communicate stewardship, and then finally, as a church, how we go about being the best stewards, putting all that into practice, who we are individually, who we are corporately, and then putting it into practice. So what I would want you to do first and foremost is what comes to your mind when you hear the word stewardship? You can drop those thoughts into the chat room and, and share with one another. But once again, historically, when we ask this question, we normally hear, oh, stewardship is something that I think of in the fall of each year. Um, and often that definition that we have of stewardship was taught to us years ago, either by sitting in the pews at the church or by someone who was a part of our early childhood or a part of our lives that we looked up to. I know I uh, attended as a child a United Methodist Church that did not do a stewardship campaign. So when I learned about stewardship individually, it was through my grandmother, my mother's mom, and my mom, who actually served as church financial secretary for years of that small mill town church where I grew up. So um, in your mind, at least think a little bit about where did you get your idea or your definition of your notion of what a steward is? So. What I will tell you is stewardship is not a fundraising activity. So often we think about uh, the United Way and the barometer that they will place somewhere strategically in the middle of town to say, look, we've set a goal and this is, this is how far or how much we've achieved toward that goal. I would encourage you not to think about stewardship as a fundraising activity. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Stewardship also are not dues paid in exchange for religious services. I actually served a church one time where I was encouraged to make sure that in my capacity as church treasurer in that particular appointment, that we sent out the uh, statements monthly because people looked at that, or many people, not all, uh, many of the people looked at that as their bill and, and it's their dues, like they looked at for a country club or some other club that they were a part of. So try to stay away from that. But stewardship is recognition of all that we have is a gift from God. If you listen to Bishop Carter's message at the beginning of the evening, he referenced this. All that we are and all that we have is of God and given to us as God's children. God has entrusted us to care for financial resources and other gifts and graces. Our church buildings are gifts to us, and we are called to be good stewards and to care for those and to invest all of those gifts into God's work in God's kingdom to make a positive difference. Sometimes it's hard. It's really hard for us to especially think about our money as being a gift from God. Why? 
because we know we worked for that. Usually, sometimes we're given money to, through an estate or a will or something. We win money. It's given to us for some reason. But for most of us, nine times out of 10, it's going to be that we worked for that money. So it's hard for us to think about the money, the financial blessings being a gift. But I'm really going to encourage you to do that because it helps helps us grow in our discipleship. And so when we think about that from a church perspective, I, I can tell you, Mark and I teach all of the incoming clergy who are in their first appointments in the conference. We meet with them through uh, similar means like this Zoom call, and we encourage them, talk to your churches and your church folk about money. Make sure that you make this an emphasis as a part of your ministry. So this is something that in your leadership role, because most of you are uh, volunteers, your laity rather than clergy, um, encourage your pastor, support your pastor in that discussion from the pulpit and in other settings, uh, because not only is it his or her responsibility, but it's important to your discipleship journey. Um, so how do we know this? There are biblical reasons. Malachi 3.10, many of you have, have recall this story. It's about bring the full tithe. We talk about tithing, biblical tithing. Bring the full tithe to the storehouse so that there might be food in my, capital M-Y, God's house, God's kingdom. And this is where um, it, we, we hear about, test me in this, and, and I will show you. Matthew 6, 21, uh, so often we hear, where our treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we translate that into our society today, Often what we would say is we'll put our money where our toys are, where those things that are exciting to us and that we're passionate about. Well, as disciples of Christ, we need to be passionate about our relationship with God. We need to be passionate about the ministries of the church. So hopefully that's where our money goes and that's what we need to teach. Luke chapter 12, uh, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Sometimes we hear this translated as required. Um, a, a big directive there, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. So biblical mandate, if, if you will, related to uh, gifts that have been given to us by God and entrusted to us. In John uh, chapter six, feeding of the 5,000, the parable of the loaves and fishes, God provides even in the midst of doubt and unbelief, God provides. And finally, I want, uh, want us to look at a video related, related to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter nine, verses six through seven. Uh, this video is from a gentleman that I was introduced to through my Bible app. His name is Pastor Will Coleman. He's from Kazon Church in St. Louis, Missouri, and he has a powerful message for us to hear this evening. So watch this video. Hey, I'm Will Coleman, and I'm the pastor of Kazon Church in St. Louis, Missouri. The verse of the day is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, and it says, Remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but the person who sows generously will also reap generously. For much of my life, one of the areas that was the hardest for me to trust God in was my finances. That's right, you all, money. I always thought to myself, if I received more money, then I would give more money. But the Apostle Paul shows us here in this verse that it's the opposite that we give more and we receive more. And I love that he used a simple farming illustration to highlight this principle. 
Now, what he's not saying here is that when you give financially to God, that God is obligated to give back to you financially. Matter of fact, that's limiting God. Rather, it's showing our trust and our faith that God is faithful to his word. And when you think about a farmer, when they plant a seed, that seed, small, but they give it generously and they have faithful expectation that what's in that seed is going to produce something way greater than what they actually planted. And the same is for us with God. We don't hold on to the seed. We don't hold on to our finances. We give to God generously because when we give, we receive far more than the money that we gave to God. So what do we do with this? Trust God, especially in the area of our finances. You see, God's blessings are not limited to just money. They go so far beyond peace, joy, strength, encouragement, wisdom, uh, love. It's God's blessings are so vast that we can't even comprehend them. But what we must do is we must trust him. So today I encourage you, don't hold on to what God has given you, but rather give it generously because what God will give back to you is so far greater than what you ever gave to him. Trust God today. God bless. Folks, this is the message that we want to be promoting in our local churches. Um, the pastor could not have said it any any better. Um, when we think about um, the the different ways in which we order our lives, um, we realize that, and I'm going to pull this up right here. What we do with our money reveals who and what we love and prioritize. God asked for our wholehearted devotion, not holding anything back. What did Jesus say to James and John? Drop your nets, come follow me. Drop everything, drop your life as you know it, come follow me. And things, people, and causes we love will cause us to rearrange how we spend the financial resources that we have. So these are all spiritual reasons as to why we give, but there are also theological reasons. The act of giving is central to worship. What God gave his only son, Jesus gave his life. When, when we take the blessings that God has given to us, we are giving to others for the betterment of God's kingdom. And how much better of an act of worship can that be? God is generous and we are created in God's image. So if we want to do what God has created us to do, then we are going to be generous. We are going to give back. So technically we could, we could stop there with the biblical reasons and the theological reasons behind giving. But as Wesleyan, as a Wesleyan church, United Methodist, we believe in this guy, this guy, John Wesley, who you see a little bobblehead up there. And he said a lot about giving financially and, and the use of money. He said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Earning all you can, meaning you put forth work, you be, you don't be lazy, you, you earn what you can, but you save enough. Uh, for the well-being of, of your family, and then giving, because John Wesley was so concerned about providing for the least of these, and he was concerned that, that he might die having too much money that he had not earned and saved, and especially given all that he should to make a positive difference in God's kingdom. So when we talk about generosity and giving and being good stewards at, as a spiritual practice, we need to be mindful that when we join the United Methodist Church, we stand before God and everyone in that church and say, we will uphold it with our prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. When we're sitting in the pews, when new members join, we promise to uphold that commitment. So we, when we talk about it and when we encourage our pastors to talk about it and emphasize it, we're just doing what we promised we would do in the first place. So 
once again, we want to focus on the tithe of income as the standard of Christian generosity. And one of the things that we realize when we do statistical data on this is that many folks are not tithing. So they say, well, I can't afford to do that. I've already gone into this lifestyle. I'm, I'm providing certain things for my family. I'm living in a certain way. So one of the things that we would want to do is to say, well, if you can't do it, at least take steps in faith toward that. So uh, one of the really good practices is to encourage people to increase by 1%. Start where you are and then just make a commitment to move forward. Also, when we practice this as a church, when we talk about it as a finance team, stewardship team, or encourage our pastor, it also gives us an opportunity to speak a pastoral word, to care for those people who may not be able to do that financially. So one of the things that we do is we encourage people to give to the general budget first. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about mission and vision of the church, but when we give to the local operating budget of the church, the general budget, then basically what we're doing is we're put, putting our money where our mouth is and saying that this is what we believe we need to be doing and we have committed to this. One of the other things that we really encourage is to practice first fruits. And it's not only saying that if I take my, get my financial blessings and the first thing that I do is give to the church for the betterment of God's kingdom, then that's saying, you know, not only is God and my commitment as a disciple really important, but also my fellow brothers and sisters that help, that are benefit from that gift, that's putting them right up there as well. And one of the things that we encourage is that when you give, I've got no strings attached in quotation marks. Um, basically what I'm talking about is don't designate and say, well, this can only be used for this purpose. Um, once again, as the community of faith known as your local United Methodist Church, uh, there is a budget that has gone before the church governing body. Hopefully it supports the mission and vision of the church and the things that are important to your church. So give to that. Um, once again, you promise to uphold that local congregation through your prayers, presence, gifts, church, service, and witness. So we encourage you to look at it that way. Certainly during the pandemic, the way we promote and carry out stewardship is done in different ways. One of those things is we give electronically. I know for years, um, I have set up the local church that my family and I worship at as a payee through my bank. So I've been giving electronically for years. But one of the things that we have seen statistically is that when you make electronic giving an option in your local church, people are more likely to give because they can. They can go on autopilot like what I just described, and it's automatically taken care of. If you do that, there is a way that the conference can help you with that, and that's uh, Mark's office through the Western North Carolina Conference portal. And they will collect the money for your church, and then they will send you that money. Um, of course, if you do this, this it, there is a cost related to this. You as a church would expect to absorb that cost. So that means you would not get the benefit of the full gift that is given, but it would be kind of what we would say cost of doing business. We would also encourage you, if you're going to encourage people to give electronically, that they not use credit cards. We don't want folks to go into debt and then find themselves in a uh, tough financial situation because they, they took their tithe or their gift to the church and, and charged it to a credit card. Um, 
So please make sure that you emphasize that if you do accept electronically. And then finally, the last bullet point, because go, go back to that commitment that we made, um, we're going to be a witness. When you put your money in a collection plate, when you give your money, you're being a witness to the folks around you by saying, I am doing this. It is an act that others witness. So if you promote giving electronically, I was just in a church the other week where I saw in the pew pocket a card that could be filled out. And when the plate came by, the, the giver could put that card in the plate as an act and as a witness to giving during um, the offering part of the worship experience. So that's something for you to, to, to think about. Um, and it's really important. So I'm going to stop there. It looks like there are some chats that have come in. Um, yeah, David, uh, I did put the link that we do for our donation. Uh, you can use this URL and customize it to put a link on your webpage or send it out to your church members. Uh, there is that option that they can pay the fee. Uh, so they just check a box so that you would get the full effect of it. It does allow for credit cards, but uh, we find that that's what churches are asking for, although our fees are much less than with most companies. You have one Thank question you. on there from Kevin. If you, can you see it? Um, is there a suggested policy wording that a church might add which would help move unused designated funds Mark, did it, do you have that by chance? I, I do. I get this question a lot. Uh, Kevin, reach out to me by email. I'll be glad. And anybody else, if you want to know, I've got a, 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 a kind of a format that I use. Uh, but the simple question of it is, whenever you do a special drive or a special cause, like for a building fund, you add a disclaimer to it that if not all funds are spent for the project or for the cause, uh, that the church council has liberty to make designations similarly to another uh, cause or something. I mean, there's ways you can do that. It's good to start that now. We didn't do it for a long time. Uh, if you do have a designated fund that people are given to, there is a sense of, you know, your own honor and obligation to use it for that. And there are, there are ways that if you're not going to, I can send you what I, I'm talking about that might help you with some church action. Yeah, I'd... My family and I actually gave to a specific cause at a at a church here in Charlotte one time, and uh, sometime later the church was unable to move forward with that project, and they just reached out to me and said, uh, "Do you mind if we use this for the general operating budget?" So that is not un unheard of. Uh, Kathy, thank you for validating what we were saying about when you use PayPal. You've seen that people give more, that it, it's uh, statistically proven. So we would really encourage you to consider that. I'm going to fly through this next section, but encourage you, um, Chris Hampton, our producer for the evening, put the PowerPoint in the chat room. And if you reach out to me following, I'll be glad to send it out to you again directly. Um, but basically, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that if you want people to give, we're talking about encouraging people to give, we're talking about people giving, but if you want them to give, you have to have a strong mission that the people have subscribed to, that they believe in, that they've been a part of, where they see things happening, where lives are changed and they feel like they're engaged in that. So often when churches contact either Mark's office or my office and they say, we have a money problem, one of the first questions I'll ask is, well, what is your mission? We know that the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. But the question is, how does your local congregation in your particular community live that out? So if you want people to give, then you have to have a compelling mission. And you need to communicate that mission. It needs to be a mission that your members have been a part of creating. And 
you know, there are two words in the English language that make a huge difference in people being compelled to give and giving again. And that is saying, thank you. That last bullet point, a sense of gratitude for the financial gifts that they give, just a simple thank you um, from the church leadership, from the pastor, making sure that people understand that there is appreciation for what they're doing. It's important for you as a leader and for your pastor to set the tone. Um, don't be apologetic about talking about money. Once again, it's a part of the discipleship journey. Uh, it's, it's a part of the leader's responsibility to set the direction. How do we live into our mission? Well, we do that by supporting outreach ministries in the community, by offering children's and youth ministry, by providing meaningful worship experiences, all of which uh, need funding to do them uh, effectively and efficiently. And of course, as a leader, if you're going to ask other people to give, then you need to be willing to give. This is simply putting your money where your mouth is. So um, people don't learn generosity, good stewardship by at osmosis. We need to intentionally teach and preach this and give people an opportunity to do so. And there are many different ways to do that. Stewardship moment, just like a mission moment, somebody that has uh, committed to good, faithful stewardship, and they get up and share their story, um, just like you would do a mission moment. And you know how transformational and meaningful that can be to a congregation. And once again, encourage your pastor to talk about the biblical themes of stewardship and generosity and giving and not just do that in the fall of the year. A uh, couple of comments about pledging or not pledging. There was a time when um, we encouraged churches to emphasize pledging or what we really moved to our estimate of giving cards, which did not sound as threatening. There's some new data out there related to that in, in that that might not be as effective as it once was back when we emphasized Consecration Sunday, new Consecration Sunday programs. Um, but one of the things that I would say to you is one size does not fit all. Every church has a history, has a culture. So we would encourage you in an effort to understand what the church is willing to participate in, that you have open discussion about it. And whatever is decided, get behind it, promote it 100%. So bringing this whole topic of being a good steward uh, kind of to, to the end here, um, how does the church be a good steward of those financial blessings? Well, I always tell folks, if you want people to stop giving, then don't hold yourself accountable when I say yourself, not only you individually, but also corporately as a church, accountable for the ways in which you use those funds. Mark talked a little bit, when, and, it, and it's all about the, the church's audit. It's looking at how you handle those funds. Is there transparency? Is there accountability? Um, are you uh, spending the money as the budget would indicate through the line items? Are there people handling the money correctly? So all of these things need to be a high priority as you look at being a good steward. Um, and some of the other things that certainly we would emphasize, most churches are saying, hey, we're just trying to keep the lights on and pay our pastor. And if we can do that, we feel like we're, we're doing well. Um, but there are churches out there that have funds that are set aside through endowments, specific initiatives. So invest those wisely. And that's something that the foundation can certainly help you with. Um, so just reach out to us. I or one of the other staff people here will be glad to, to help you because we have several different options uh, to help. So 
I'm going to stop there because I went one minute over nine o'clock um, and knowing that your time is valuable. I um, want to stop and ask if there are any questions. Mark. So we have any... asked one about the thoughts on compelling givers across generations. And I, whew, one thing I thought about that is, you know, we are having this massive transfer of wealth from one generation to another. And if you have a group in your church that is a part of the, 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 the shifters of this wealth, bring them together. Have, have some kind of forum with them and help them understand not only do they fill out what, you know, their wills and estate planning, but how can they help encourage and mentor their younger generation, their younger children, or their, their to, to, to model what they're doing. They're your key. They've been doing it. You're losing them through attrition and death and whatever. Grab a hold of them and, and let them be your ambassadors, if you will, versus the pastor or, or uh, just the finance leaders trying to move in this. David, I want to take a liberty. If I were for them go, this has come up with several of them. I'm going to post a little survey, a little poll. And it's going to ask about payroll services for churches. And it's going to ask about, would you be interested in the conference providing bookkeeping services for your church? So I'm launching this poll right now. Hopefully you can see it and take a moment to, um, to post your answers for that. And we'll consider that. Not making any promises at this point, but I am interested in what people uh, might see about this. So take a moment and do that. And then I'm going to let David uh, close us out. So Mark mentioned, and with the poll, um, this is something that we've talked about uh, our two offices together, and we want to try to help in whatever ways we can. So your input and information is of great importance. And, and, and if we want to pause just a moment, David, you pray us out, but we'll keep the Zoom open for a little while longer, and you have an opportunity to respond so that not all of you feel like you got to hang around. Okay. So before I pray us out of here, thank you once again for your commitment to your local church and for your time. Um, just so grateful. And so many of you, your faces are familiar. There is one thing that I would have mentioned if I would have had more time, and that is uh, at the 1st of February through E-News, Western North Carolina Conference E-News, you will hear about the certificate program in church treasury. This is a program that Mark's office and our office offers every year, and it, it's a really deeper dive. There, a lot of the information you heard this evening will be included in that, but it's a multiple week, two in person, two uh, via Zoom sessions. So if you feel like uh, you could benefit from that and learn more, then be on the lookout for that and reach out to us. So um, with that said, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you, are, you empower us to do ministry. We give you thanks for this church of ours that, that cares enough to make sure that we do it right, that we be the best stewards of the gifts and graces for ministry that you have given to us. So as we leave our time together this evening, we pray that all that we have learned and all that we have heard, that you will help us to take it and use it for the betterment of your kingdom. May our words be your words, our thoughts be your thoughts, but most importantly, oh God, may our actions be pleasing in your sight. We offer this prayer in your son's most gracious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank Chris Hampton for being our producer. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chris.